The name is Jonathan Gannon, but people call me John. It's Mr. Gannon if you don't know me. I'm old school like that. But if you do know me like that, sometimes it's just Broheem. Or if you know me really well, I might let you get away with a Johnny boy. Maybe. I'm 40 years old and still a bachelor. Some folks think that it's kind of strange. They think that there might be something wrong with me. Who knows, maybe there is. If you ask me, what it really comes down to is my line of work. I've been a private investigator for over a decade now. Never thought I'd live to say that. Yet, here I am. I think it often goes that way. People with a certain personality type always think that they're gonna die young. So they don't really plan for the future and once they get there, they don't understand why it is that they have nothing, why the world has moved on around them. These types of folks, and I'm one of them, were just made different. We're God's miscreant children. We live for the moment, that most elusive feeling in the moment where one occasionally finds a small eternity. We're able to live entire lifetimes, maybe multiple lifetimes, just inside that little moment that passes utterly unnoticed by the vast majority of men. Even though it's surprising, given my calling in life, maybe I have a bit of the mentality of an artist and I think that might be what makes me so good at what I do. Looking back, I think I was always searching for the meaning of life in each case that I took. Off the clock, I was searching for the same, just in different places. The bottom of the bottle, the strip joints, the poker tables. You've heard that kind of tale of debauchery before, though. I'm sure you've seen leaving Las Vegas, so you can fill all the blanks I leave you. Let's just say if there's a low place you can imagine, baby, I've seen it. So I'll spare you all the kitty stuff. All but the essential details. I'm about to bring you into a strange epoch in my life and career. The details I'm about to reveal may not paint me in the best light, but that's okay. I've been through the great ego death by now. You can think what you like about me. Partly, I just need to get it off my chest. In addition, I've had one hell of a career and with all the enemies I've made over that time, every day I wake up, could be my last and I have no illusions on this point, my friend. I need to tell the story my way before I take the big sleep. So with no further ado, the first time I met Thomas Darth was 10 years ago when he walked into my office, which was on Main Street at the time. I was set up in a small retail space in Central Jersey. I move frequently now for safety reasons, but Back then I'd been running the same space for about two years. I don't know if you ever started a business from scratch before, but maybe it goes without saying. Anyhow, it's one hell of a stretch for the first couple of years. Each day you can see the entire thing getting slammed by a meteor and going up in flames. I was taking almost every case that came in through the door, desperate to pay my rent and utilities and have enough left over to put food on the table. I know in all the movies they make this gig look glamorous, oak desks, expensive decor, a secretary in the foyer, and it goes on. The reality of it, it was a storefront window in a one-room office with a half bathroom, less than 500 square feet for 1500 a month. So sure, I had a cheap vinyl sign plastered on the window for Jonathan Gannon, PI for hire. I had one of those metal fold-out tables for a desk with one of those swivel computer chairs and a couple of bookcases with several filing cabinets, printers, and other office supplies. My customers had a set of plain metal folding chairs to sit in. You get the picture, it was nothing fancy. But I was producing results in those early days and so my name was getting around a bit. Due to this state of affairs, there I sat, rubbing my eyes as the door to the place opened letting in a blaze of early morning sunlight. I'd only just put away the cot I slept in, sliding it behind a couple of filing cabinets and unlocking the door. 
I quickly grabbed an empty scotch bottle and dumped it into the cabinet I kept under the desk with my sawed-off 12-gauge in it. This was a precaution that anyone sleeping in a storefront on Main Street would have taken if they had any brains at all. Yeah, come in, I croaked, my eyes desperate to get this man to come in and shut the door. But he seemed hesitant. Sorry, I thought this was John Gannon's place? In the flesh, Brahim, come on in, what's on your mind? Back then I didn't insist on Mr. Gannon to those who didn't know me. Lot changes when you get some credibility in your art. Thomas Darth walked in with apprehension, still painted on his face as he looked around the joint. He was a slim man with dark hair who cut a striking figure in his $10,000 suit. Me? I was from a working class background, and I'm sure he could smell the filth of decades maybe even the genetic filth in me. Before he'd gone more than a few steps in, he stopped and he asked me, You came highly recommended from someone I trust dearly. I didn't expect. He cut himself short, realizing the position he was placing himself in. This was an unusual feat for one of the filthy rich who'd come from centuries of money. I found myself slightly impressed by the act of self-restraint in verbally abusing the lower class. You see, by this point, I dealt with plenty of clients from Central Jersey, from Manhattan, Long Island, and the Hamptons, you name it. I was used to the casual dismissals and disparagement that the rich so capably reigned upon the heads of the lower classes. This guy had a little more self-awareness than I was accustomed to in the rich. I could tell by this small gesture alone that he was definitely new money. People never changed. His dress was definitely too refined to have been in the tech sphere, and so I deduced that he would likely tell me he had made his money in importing or some other dubious sounding venture. Well, thank your friend for the kind words, I said to him. Sorry to disappoint if this place ain't up to your standards. He looked instantly hurt and fragile. I beg your pardon, sir, I meant nothing by it. It's only, nowadays, there are plenty of con men and scammers out there, ready to take advantage of a man's misfortunes. It seemed comical at the time to sit there listening to this man, whose outfit cost more than my life waxing poetic about his misfortunes. But still, something about him instantly ingratiated his person to me. He seemed like one of those naive, stick-up-the-ass types who's honest to a fault. I could feel a soft spot growing and warping the steel of my armor in that moment. Hey, don't worry about it. I ain't got no feelings anyways. I believe in plain speaking. Say what you mean and mean what you say makes for a simple life, don't you agree? He walked in sincerely now and sat down in one of my metal folding chairs without putting on any airs about his comfort or delicacy. Yes, yes I very much agree with that sentiment. I could see that his features were delicate and refined, his frame not masculine but aquiline. Though I was sure he came from the working class, it appeared as if his bloodline could have been that of royalty, the pale, wan, and veiny, iridescent skin, almost like a gelatinous membrane stretched thin, if not for the chalkiness of it. So, I continued, fighting back the migraine which began assaulting me from the moment he had opened that door. What can I do for you, pal? Sorry, I didn't catch your name. It's Thomas. Thomas Darth. Pleasure to meet you, Tom. I said, shortening the name, a tactic I typically use to accelerate the process of trust building. Pleasure is all mine, he replied with his good manners. Well, I said, putting some of my bad ones on display. Am I troubling you, sir? He asked stupidly. No, not, not at all. I'm very interested in what might have brought you to my stoop on this day. It's only, I'm a very busy man, and I'm sure you are as well, so I'd like to get down to business with no further delay, if that's alright with you. 
Tell you what, something I find helps on occasion is... I pull the fresh bottle of scotch from under the desk along with two rocks glasses. Well, it's a bit early, he objected. No, no, I won't hear of it. This is just the thing we need right now. I poured us each a glass, shoving one across the table towards him while grabbing mine and slurping it down greedily as hair of the dog medicine. Thomas, on the other hand, stared at it disdainfully before, wary of being caught in the act, he grabbed it up and began sipping daintily at the harsh stuff. There, there, that's better. I spoke as if we were old friends as I poured myself another and sucked it down in turn. Now, my friend, I spoke with growing boisterousness. What'll it be? What brings you to my doorstep? Some relationship or marital troubles, perhaps? I threw this last in, taking a gamble, which was almost sure to win. Eighty plus percent of the cases I took hinged on this very matter. It was a made hand. He looked at me uncomfortably at first, but the dam finally broke. Well, yes, after all, you've nailed it. Something of the kind. He gazed at me with a hollow stare and a trembling lip, before gathering himself up a bit and stiffening that lip. Whereupon he added, Sorry to be so transparent, old boy. I'm sure it takes some of the life out of it. But it is reassuring. It tells me you're very familiar with circumstances such as those I currently face, and that you're just the technician for the job. He looked at me uncertainly, as if maybe this last would have offended me in some manner, but I quickly cleared the table, removing all doubt on this score. You came to the right place, so that's the first thing you done right, and you didn't go wrong. I poured myself yet another glass as the excitement carried me away. Secondly, I can follow the missus if it pleases you. I offer a certain number of man-hours and photographs per hundred dollars. We can talk about that before you contract me. If you want me to stake out her lover too, that could be twice the hours and a moat more dangerous. So I typically charge more. It'll be double the price. Thomas looked at me with a glare of frustration. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I never said anything about any such kind of impropriety. I leveled him with my eyes and spoke in a low, possibly threatening tone. Then what exactly are we talking here, Tommy boy? I need to know. He only cringed a little at my vulgar address. He looked highly uncomfortable at this line of questioning, and I could sense him squirming in his seat. I could tell his pulse has quickened, his heart was pounding in his chest. Well, that's the thing, I... I don't exactly know. You don't know what? Out with it! I blurted out now, growing entirely impatient and ferocious with him. I don't know anything, he returned with equal violence, whereupon he spat with a desperate rapidity. I don't know if she's seeing someone or who it might be. I don't know if she's stealing from me or how much. I don't know if she's sabotaging my work or in what manner. And lastly, I don't know if she's poisoning me. So there I sat, watching the guy nearly hyperventilate. I got the stark feeling that I was sitting across the table from a raving Looney Tune. I'd had them come in before, trying to contract me for a case that turned out to be a complete fabrication of their imagination. In this line of work, a wild goose chase, it's bound to happen to you eventually. I looked at him quizzically. Tom, you gotta level with me. You gotta give me more to go on than that. Could be this, could be that. Break it down for me. What evidence do you have of infidelity? Or worse, I've been known to be a little slow, so don't hold back any of the nitty-gritty details that help me put the pieces together. He looked back at me helplessly, as if his resources had been desperately drained. I could tell this wasn't going to be an easy nut to crack. It's okay. 
We're taking it slow. Just start from the beginning, pal. When did you first notice that something wasn't right? He sighed a world-weary traveler's sigh. I could see the pains it was costing him to lift this burden again, and in particular to share it with another, and who was especially a stranger. Okay, I'll try my best, but I think I need to get straight to the point. The problem is, these blackouts I've been experiencing of late. I sat myself up a little further in my chair and leaned forward with interest now. He had my attention. Unexplained blackouts was something to go on. Blackouts? I questioned him immediately. He blinked a few times as if thrown off by my sudden animation. Well, that's right, lost time, particularly at night, with no reasonable explanation. Just chunks of my life from which I remember nothing, during which I had imbibed no substances, and hadn't been under any unreasonable duress or pressure, only it's not totally lost, for there are dreams that I remember when I awake. But I never intentionally went to sleep, so it's not sleep either, and it's not quite like normal sleep. The dreams are far more vivid, which makes the whole even more surreal. He looked right through me with a dreamy gaze as he spoke, like as if he were looking beyond me as if the subject matter of those excursions, or perhaps the weight of what was for him an insoluble riddle, was currently racking and raking his mind, pulling him off into some other torturous dimension where consciousness struggles for a grip of something solid to hold on to. I narrowed my eyes at him now, frowning. And what are the dreams about? Now I could tell we were getting somewhere. I could smell real fear in the air now as the perspiration broke out on his forehead, and his hand reached into his pocket for a kerchief which he daintily dabbed at his face with. They're most sensational, most terrible, nothing like I've ever experienced before. I was beginning to grow tired of all this man's dramatic effects and cliffhangers. The glass of scotch in my hand was barely kicking the ass of my stage four hangover. Well, I muttered sourly, letting it hang in the air with emphasis. He looked apologetic as if he were finally coming to his wits, as if he now realized how much he'd been dancing around the subject with an unwilling dance partner. It appears my silly hang-ups are spoiling our first acquaintance. And I don't want that by any means. You'll excuse me, I hope, some social awkwardness, some deviations from the normal decorum. I've suffered my whole life with this nervous condition, this anxiety of being caught out by others, of telling the truth about myself, my inclinations, and so forth. In brief, who I really am. I'm afraid I've been a master of the outward appearance my whole life, and... I'm sure it's contributed most handsomely to my successes, but is now the linchpin of personal failures. And so I'll have you know that I consider the subject of these dreams to be of a highly personal nature. And that goes for everything I've told you or will tell you today. My entire business, my wealth, and my personal life could all collapse in one fatal implosion were any of this information to fall into the wrong hands. A man who's done anything important in life has enemies, you know. I lifted my glass in the air. I'll drink to that one, Tommy boy. Now, now, keep going, sorry to interrupt. Yes, I see you take my meaning very well, and I've already been reassured that you're a man who can keep the most strict of confidences. And so I must simply place my whole trust in you, though I know you even less than Adam. With no further ado, though the dreams vary in nature, here and there, and in their subject matter, a common theme in them has been the appearance of a drunken and disheveled woman who utters lewd and shameful remarks, 
who makes obscene gestures. She is a harlot, perhaps. I don't know. I can never quite make out her face in the dreams, for it is always obscured by some sort of shadow, particularly from the mid-face upwards. But each time she appears under varied circumstances, I find myself inexplicably aroused and drawn to her. Despite my simultaneous feelings of extreme disgust, which leads me into the most despicable of acts, which can occur seemingly anywhere, sometimes in public, in front of friends or family, or in the middle of a business meeting, for instance. What do you think all this contradiction means? The whole of this confession he had remained with eyes fixated downwards, as if some Goliath struggle were occurring within him, and he had summoned all of his powers of concentration for this life-or-death battle of wills. At the end, with his question, all of that enormous focus had left him, and he looked at me as one with the thought processes of a child, asking an adult if they can fix their shattered porcelain doll. I stared at him for a bit in silence, letting it all sink in, rolling it around a bit with my tongue, as if I were kneading a ball of dough in my mouth. Well, Mr. Darth... I know I asked for this, but I'm no Sigmund Freud over here. I hope you understand that. This ain't no free therapy session. So all I can tell you is whether it's material to the case or not. And I'll tell you one thing. We've been sitting here the better part of a half hour, and I still don't know squat about whether there's even a case here or not. In fact... I can't make heads or tails of anything you've said since you walked in my door today. I'm sorry. I don't think I can help you. I'm not the right guy for the job. Go find someone else. Due to all my experiences over the years, I had a sixth sense for danger. As I'd spoken, I noticed a growing tension in the man as the meaning of my words dawned on him. Before I could say anything else, he was on his feet and the bulge in his jacket pocket I'd been eyeing for the past 25 minutes had materialized into a small pistol which he wielded high over his head. My hand instantly reached for the sawed-off under my desk. My finger flicked the safety off and then rested on the trigger, pointing the barrel under the desk at where I estimated was his groin where one shell of buckshot would be able to tear halfway through him like a hot knife through butter. I always kept one in the chamber. Before it came to that point, he rested the barrel of his pistol on his own temple. His eyes were wild and crazed like nothing I've ever seen before at that point. His lips trembled and he stuttered to get the words out. This is my last stop, Mr. Gannon. To say I was desperate for help would be a massive understatement. I can't stand it for one more day. If this goes unabated, self-slaughter would be the only kindness left that I could render unto myself. It's the mystery, the constant paranoia, the betrayals, whether real or imagined, the feeling that I've lost control of my senses, that I might be losing my mind is too much for a man like me to bear any longer. I've suffered in silence till now, but I won't forever. I saw his fist clench at this last proclamation, and I held my hands up, taking them off of the hand cannon that I held under the desk in a rare fit of pity and empathy for another man. Mr. Darth, I was only joshing you. You know, trying to force you to get to the point a little quicker. I'm just tired is all. But I got all day. I've already accepted your case. The moment you walked in the door, I knew you were the one. We just need to calm down and sort this out. That's right. Put the gun down. Flick the safety back on. And put it in your jacket, buddy. a boy. 
Now we're going to start fresh. I'm just going to ask you some very simple and direct questions. And you're going to answer them to the best of your ability. He sat back down in the chair now, looking like a man totally defeated with exhaustion, as if he might fall asleep right in the chair in front of me as I talked at him. He had gone white as a ghost and was now quite soaked through with sweat. He looked sickly on top of it, as if he might be nauseous, might start losing his lunch all over the place at any moment. Yes, he muttered. Yes, I rather like that suggestion. You lead, I'll follow. I've made quite a mess of things. I'm so mortified. I didn't give him a chance to get us going in circles again. Now, now, enough of that. Tell me, what does your wife do for a living? How long you been married to her? As I spoke, I pulled my notepad and pen over, ready to start recording the data. He was by now so folded up, so drained, that I could have sworn he'd fainted before he finally muttered. She's a stay-at-home wife. She's a kept woman, I cut in. No, not exactly. She volunteers at a nonprofit in town. We've been married for two years, but since she started volunteering six months ago, we barely see one another. The place opens at night once most of the volunteers get off work. So when I get home, she's out the door soon after. Okay, okay, I see. Non-overlapping work schedule. So is she always home on time? That's just the thing. That's why I was telling you about the blackouts. They began about the same time she started volunteering. He spoke now as if he were a man who'd finally been vindicated after years of pleading his case. I rubbed my fingers through the growth of beard on my cheeks. I see, Mr. Darth. I think we're getting somewhere now. That's what we in the business call a coincidence as in two seemingly unrelated events occurring at the same time only. He interrupted me this time. Only you don't believe in coincidences. That's it, Tommy boy. You're a quick study. Maybe you should be the one sitting behind the desk here. So tell me this. When you came in earlier, you said something about poisoning. So maybe your wife's been slipping you a Mickey or something in your dinner cocktail. Is that what you fear? He looked at me confusedly. I... I wouldn't say so, dear fellow. I don't believe she'd ever do something like that. What could possibly be the motive? And then there's the dreams as well. He swallowed as if he were preparing himself, digging deep and grasping at a formulation for the entirety of what he was experiencing. When he spoke, he did so with the furled brow and slitted eyes of the fanatic. I feel that there are dark powers beyond all our comprehension descending upon me. My life has somehow come to an intersection with the supernatural realm. Perhaps my life has always carried with it this inescapable fatality written in the bloodline. I return the seriousness of his gaze now. Mr. Darth... Trust me, whatever is going on, I'm going to get to the bottom of it. So help me God. You've done all you can. Now let me do my job. And I think you'll be surprised at what falls out when I shake the tree. I just need a few more details to get started. Your wife's name, phone number, the address where she volunteers, make and model of her car license plate, and so on. You get the picture? Other than that, I'm going to need your Jan Hancock on this here contract. And my retainer, of course. Lastly, I'd like you to take that glass in front of you. You've been milking the whole time, and join me in a toast. To the truth. The only guiding light ye shall ever need. The truth shall set you free, Mr. Darth. It shall make mole hills out of the most terrifying mountains that loom over you. Trust me, I never stop looking until I find the truth. 
I downed the liquor, and this time, Mr. Darth followed suit. I could, by the look in his eyes, see that our agreement had given him the first tiny mote of serenity he'd seen in the past six months. In the days following our meeting, every word, every facial expression, every mannerism of Mr. Darth stuck in my mind. Repeated words and movements gained new meanings when viewed from new angles. I'd gotten to work immediately, seeing as his was the only contract I had open at the time. I decided to start things out the good old-fashioned way. I was going to stake the house out, keep my eye on her during the day. Once Mr. Darth came home, I'd follow her downtown and watch her movements during the night. This was the simple part of the job, but admittedly difficult to do right. It took a lot of patience and persistence to tail someone like that. If your tenacity waned and you missed even 10% of their day, you might miss the one thing that would have blown up the whole case. You know how it is. People only spent 10% of their time doing the worst 10% of the deeds they would commit. The rest of their time was spent in some kind of semi-vegetative state. As I rolled up on the first day of the stakeout with a thermos full of coffee, I pulled up to a veritable mansion up in the hills surrounded by the woods, complete statues in the driveway, an infinity pool and large barbecue in back, a tennis court on one side, a lazy river that wrapped around part of the property by the tree line. It wasn't your typical suburban street where I could act like I had business being parked there. So I had to keep my distance and found a little path in the woods up the road, kind of like an old dirt road that was covered over with fallen leaves and other brush, where I could pull in and keep an eye on the front of the place while maintaining almost complete cover. I'd done this sort of thing dozens of times, but typically had to deal with the threat of nosy neighbors and the like. From that perspective, it was a pretty nice setup. I pulled my notepad out as I watched a car pull out of the massive four-door attached garage. It was Mr. Darth driving the Ferrari. I jotted down the time and a few other notes of things that came to me as his appearance jogged my memory of our former encounter. If he'd seen me, he hadn't shown any sign of it. And so test number one was completed. It looked like my camouflage position would do the trick. That's when it was time to hurry up and wait. I sat there for hours admiring the house with all its stillness. I couldn't make out any signs of life inside. And so I began to grow impatient, wondering if there was anyone else even home that day like he'd said there would be. Maybe his wife had a last second change of plans and he'd forgotten to mention it. After a couple of hours, my nerves started getting the best of me. Like I said, this was always the hardest part of the job, especially with no signs of life in the area. Typically, you'd at least have had a couple of neighbors and plenty of passerbys to keep an eye on. Mr. Darth owned acres of land. The nearest neighbors were at least a mile off down the road. Eventually, I got out and started walking the perimeter, making sure to keep under the cover of the trees. I'd walked the perimeter twice before I returned to the car by then having memorized every detail of the property and the lazy river that streamed across it. But still, nothing had stirred in that house. So I had a lot of time on my hands, a lot of time to think, and that's when the mind tended to get up to no good. All of my demons, all the skeletons in my closet at once started creeping out of the darkness, reaching their cold, bony claws out towards my warm flesh. I could sense that those who had died by my side or even died by my hand in the line of duty were jealous of the living, wanted to pull us down into those graves with them and suffocate the life out of us, maybe so we would be equal with them. The chaos that emerges when we lack stimuli, the mixture of horrible memories from the past and our dread of the unknown future combines to create a boiling mental soup that's the nearest we can get to hell on earth. The series of images that passes through the mind, even against one's will, is too much to bear. 
and that's why I always kept busy with one case after the next. I couldn't stand downtime. I never took a vacation, not most folks' idea of one anyway. I faded in and out of these memory traps, these inescapable trances, until the late afternoon when I saw the Ferrari pull back up the driveway and park inside the garage. It was Thomas Darth, and he was alone. I had the impulse to go knock on the door and say something, to ask him whether his wife was even there today. But the better angels of my nature prevailed. I knew better. I needed to keep up with this monk-like patience either until I saw her leave the house or the night became the day. Luckily for me, it was only another hour before I was startled out of my seat by another of the garage doors suddenly whirring into action. I heard the roar of an engine starting and then a black beamer slowly slid down the driveway. As it passed my vantage point, I spat my coffee all over the dashboard as a coughing fit overwhelmed me. I couldn't breathe. The case had blown wide open. What I discovered is that I'd met Mrs. Darth before. In fact, I knew her personally, by another name entirely. Rather than the name I'd been given of Veronica Darth, where I met her, she went by Angel. Around six months prior, a woman had come into my office one early morning on a Friday. I'd seen many women walk into my place with mascara dripping down their cheeks, distraught with shame and embarrassment at the fact that they'd ended up here in my dungeon, in need of the services of a man like me. But this broad, she was like nothing I'd seen before. She came in cool as a cucumber. She was businesslike and professional about the contract. Didn't even ask me how this works. All but told me what the terms were and what it was I needed to do. She wanted me to follow her husband of all things. His behavior had changed drastically. She suspected the worst. I signed on without skipping a beat. It was another bread and butter case for the likes of me. I thought I had this whole thing in the bag, an easy lunch, but later that night, that whole deal fell apart. That night, I'd stop down to the old strip joint down the block. Places like that were a regular haunt of mine back then. Not only was it a little adult entertainment, but a great place to meet future clients. And I was a hustler, baby. I remember on that day I'd walked in and sat down at a table near the stage, seeing as the place was mostly empty with only a few daytime drunks slouching about the joint. Just as I was settling myself in with a glass of scotch, neat, and a cigarette, the curtains opened and there she was, Angel. The way she moved across that stage, you would have took her for one too. The way she floated as if it was on the ethanol vapors of those slouched over drunks. She was so carried away by her act, despite the limp crowd she was playing to, that I don't think she even recognized my presence until the second song came on. Man, that one could have been her swan song. The way she went all out, holding eye contact with me the whole time in that smoky room where each moment was a limitless abyss, and I was in free fall. I was under her moonlight spell and I couldn't tear my eyes away. The dance, so magnetic, so graceful, as if I were watching some human-feline hybrid, where each step was as soft and as calculated as that of a leopard. The technicality of it, the gyrations and gymnastic feet were unrivaled on the stage, and I thought to myself she was one of a kind, one in a million, a diamond in the rough. This strange hypnotism I had fallen under, I have to say, I've never experienced its equal from a woman's movement since. For it wasn't only the grace of the act, and the art, but the suggestiveness of it, the inimitable provocation of it, the terrible and dark lasciviousness of it, the salacious appetites that it engendered, that had me almost exploding out of the chair at the same time my willpower was stretched to its limit as I clutched my scotch glass with what must have been the whitest of knuckles, fighting for air as my heart pounded out of my chest with minor fibrillations. 
This next level experience of soaring on a higher plane of desire than other men have known stands out to me as a crystallized experience, a memory so rich and solid and with so many multifaceted surfaces that each time in the remembrance it's like living it in the flesh anew, but from a completely fresh perspective. After everything that's happened since, I sometimes pray for a traumatic brain injury to erase that which is irreversibly seared into the mind. Up to this point, my story is no different from the last one you read. I fell for her. I fell damn hard. And either she succumbed to me, or maybe I succumbed to her. My angel. Later that night, when the joint was alive and packed to the brim, she finally made her way over to the table where I'd sat petrified like a statue since the first time I laid eyes on her. I remember every word spoken as if it were yesterday. Come here often, stranger, or are you lost? You look a bit lost, she asked me. Don't play games with me, Angel. Do you really expect me to believe your husband knows about this gig of yours? She looked at me with eyes narrowed. You weren't thinking about my husband when I was on the stage. She said it matter-of-fact-like, and I have to say, she was right. As the case may be, You know it creates serious reservations about me even taking on a case like this now. Makes me think you might have had ulterior motives in coming to my office with the contract. She mockingly placed her hand over her mouth and widened her eyes as if I'd offended her sensibilities before coolly flicking her cigarette into the ashtray and quipping, You're a bright boy after all. I'm sure you made all the grades in school. Now what are you going to do about my little trick, now that the Black Widow has you in its web? I looked at her now with a nervous passion that was bleeding through my shirt. When you put it that way, all I can do is close my eyes and pray it don't hurt too much. The rest of the night I only have fragments of, but it doesn't matter much. That night we consummated our infidelity and it wasn't the last time I saw her. In fact, The night I sat outside Thomas Darst's mansion and watched that beamer disappear on the drive, I knew exactly where it was headed. I began to sense a fatal collision course as the end game of this case. If I didn't get it under control, something quick. In no time, I was tearing down the night highway at about 80 with the accelerator to the floor chasing after her. I finally caught up to her at our destination. She was putting a cigarette out before she opened the door to the Italian restaurant we were meeting at and went inside. As I pulled into the parking lot, parking a few cars down from the Beamer, I reflected that to that day I'd never seen the car she drove. Other than the nice clothes she wore, had no idea how wealthy a woman she was. Any place we were meeting at, she'd always gotten there before me and left afterwards, and I always paid which I hadn't seen anything strange about until now. I bypassed the host and swerved through long rows of tables until I came to the bar in the back of the joint, where I saw her seated at the end waiting for me. She was wearing the same red dress she'd put on after her shift on the night I met her, the one that had killed me with its slit from the hip down the thigh. When she sees me walk in, she gives me that old half-smile where she kicks up one side of her mouth. Just then a waitress appeared, signaling her into the dining room, and she nodded at me as she followed that waitress into the room. I walked up to the bar, laid down some cash, and ordered a drink before following in the same direction. I found her sat down in a shadowy booth in the far corner of the joint, sipping a dirty martini with three olives on a spear. As I sat down across from her, I watched as she pulled that spear out and delicately sucked one of the olives off, letting it rest between her lips with a succulent glare in my direction. I crumbled as she pulled it into her mouth and began crushing it with her back teeth in the most delicate way between those fluffy lips. Again, I felt that strange power and sway that she held over me as my face grew hot and feverish with desire surging within me. Within moments, I felt her foot, which had slipped out of its heel, resting in the crotch of my pants. 
I reached down quickly with my hand with the intention of pushing it away, but when I touched those toes I merely melted like putty in her hands and began massaging that perfectly formed foot. When the waitress came back to take our order, that's when the spell broke. I shoved her foot down and barked out the usual for the both of us. By now she could tell something was up. I saw her across the table batting her eyelashes at me in that mysterious way, observing every muscle twitch in my body as I tensed up in preparation for battle. What's the matter, baby? She looked at me with coy eyes. Cat got your tongue. I paused, took a deep breath, and downed the rest of my scotch before I answered. Look here, Angel. I got your card. The game is up. Again, she gave me those sarcastic airs. Oh, whatever do you mean, Mr. Gannon, Mr. Detective? I pounded the table with my fist, drawing somewhat more attention from the surrounding patrons than I had intended. What do I mean? What do I mean? Let's start with Thomas Darth, your husband. Yeah, I know him. I know your real name, too. And I know you never left like you told me you did. What's the matter, baby? Cat got your lying tongue, angel baby? She gave me that same half smile again, leaning back into the shadows of the booth so that all I could see was her lower face. What did you want from me, John? Was it a happily ever after? The world is a bigger place than that little office of yours. We had our fun, and that's a thing perfect in itself. But I never took you for the type that was in it for the long haul. The type that'd be getting up at two in the morning to change a newborn's diaper. If you catch my meaning, you're too selfish. All you care about is that silly work of yours. You live for it. You die without it. And for an investigator such as yourself, all I can say is you wanted to be fooled, didn't you? How else can you explain your willingness to believe? You coming off at me like that is rich indeed. I sat nearly swallowing my tongue as I listened. I felt powerless in the grip of her sadistic and all-powerful words with the magic to destroy a man. But I knew I had to have the better of her. I shrugged my shoulders and lit a cigarette, dragging on it deeply before blowing it across the table in her face. Think what makes you feel better, baby makes no difference to me. You were one face among a hundred, and I've seen them all, sweetie. Just don't like being lied to is all. That's a dumb whore's trick. Thought you were a little more sophisticated is all. Guess I was fooling myself. That you were that kind of broad, I said to her in the last. I could see she wasn't taking the bait. Not a micro expression of pain or fear or shame did cross her face. She merely stared back with that unassailable look of a prime piece of tail that defies all insult. She lifted her martini to her lips and drained the thing, leaving a red lipstick impression on the glass before picking up the spear between two fingers and devouring the remaining olives. She stood up silently and before she turned said simply, Farewell, Mr. Detective. Our fun and games are over until we meet again and left the table. I sat there in the booth, struck dumb as the waitress brought the appetizers out and set them down. When she asked if I needed a refill, I snapped, no, goddamn you, after which I think she got the picture of what had happened. If I'm being honest, I didn't know what to do or how to feel. I fought back every emotion that tried to poke its ugly head up out of that whack-a-mole. I'd been burned. It was the first time I'd been burned. Maybe that's what hurt most. But I wasn't going to let a fallen angel take me down. Before I knew what I was doing, I was back in the car, cruising at 80 out of town, back towards the Darth residence. As I raced through the hills, through the clouds of her tire dust, I knew that she was taunting me all the way. For my part, in that short time, I determined to confront Thomas Darth in his own home to blow the case wide open and let him know that I, personally, had been having carnal relations with his wife, come what may. This was how I knew a real man would handle this type of thing, 
and I'd be damned to crawl under the rug and try to hide this infidelity from a man who had entrusted his very life in me. As I rolled up to the mansion, the fog had grown thicker, maybe than I'd ever seen before in that area. I circled the parking loop and jumped out by the front door. As I jumped out of the car and raced up to the front door, I said to myself, Devil, come what may, with the attitude of an irreversibly injured young man. I remember watching myself pounding on that door as if I were outside my own body. It was an out-of-body experience. As I pounded on the door, it wasn't long before the damn thing got answered. There I stood, standing in front of Thomas Darth in his full birthday suit, naked as the day he was born. I couldn't help letting my eyes wander down to his peacemaker, his manhood which stood flailing in the strong wind that had developed in the meantime while he stood blinking at me. What the hell, Thomas? I asked him as his pendulum continued to oscillate in the night like a grandfather clock. My apologies, Mr. Gannon. I'm not quite sure what came over me. Blackouts. He turned and walked back into the darkness of the house, leaving me hanging there with the invitation of the open door. I followed after him. It was hard to see at first and nearly impossible to navigate, seeing as I'd never been in the place before and had no mental map of what to expect. Barely, just on the threshold of my vision, I saw a swinging door oscillating as if someone had just gone through it. In the far room, there was a large window through which the moonlight beamed in, revealing a kitchen counter. The chasm between me and that kitchen door seemed hopelessly unmanageable in the pitch darkness. Thomas, Tommy boy, I called out as I stumbled forward one step at a time, bumping my knee into what I took for a large leather couch. Where is she, Tom? Where's Veronica? I cried out with only silence as the answer. I tried a new tact. You can't run from this angel. This is a final reckoning. She's been playing us both, Mr. Darth, and her game is up. I'd made it past the couch, but now found my shins knocking into a side table of sorts. I was so close to that door I'd seen him go in. As my eyes continued to adjust to the dark, I visualized a grand staircase off to my right leading into the upper reaches of the house. I figured Angel must be up there somewhere. But I'd made up my mind to find Mr. Darth first so that we might confront her together. Before I could stumble any further, and as I opened my mouth to shout another call out, the door swung open again. There stood Veronica Darth, stark naked as her husband had been. The moonlight beaming into the room from behind her outlined her breasts and the curves of her body. What's going on, Angel? What kind of sick game? I couldn't see her face while in the dark, but I could smell the sweat of her body, the sweet odor so recognizable to me by then. Come on, Angel. Veronica. Come to Mommy. Mommy's here, my boy. Worse than this strange uttering was the tone of the voice, which was low but high-pitched and moaning, somehow a mixture of baritone and soprano chords simultaneously. Angel, stop this. Don't be scared, my boy. This is just mommy's body, mommy's skin, mommy's rolls. She moved her hands up and down, rubbing the flanks of her smooth body. Somehow that voice had gotten into my head. My mind felt like a scrambling egg, filled with panic as I found my feet carrying my body towards her. That's it, she said. My brave little boy. Mommy wants to hold you. Mommy wants you to sit on her lap. I struggled with all my might and found that my foot started tapping and skidding on the floor as if two unstoppable forces were driving it in opposite directions. Come get some milk, my boy. You are so hungry. I hear your stomach growling, silly boy. Don't be afraid of Mommy's slit. That's where you came from. Mommy can show you. That's it, my good boy. I had lost the battle as a terrible migraine overwhelmed my consciousness, 
blurring my vision and nearly causing me to faint. When I was in arm's reach, the adrenaline electrified my whole body in one last ditch flight or fight response. I was able to stop moving forward, to step backwards, but as I did, I could now see her clearly for the first time. She took a step towards me when it happened, something which almost defies my ability to represent with words, though the sick sight of it is seared in my mind. Her breasts suddenly shrunk, like balloons deflating. Her crotch bulged and half her face bulged out, becoming angular. That's when I heard, No, leave him alone. Don't hurt him. But the voice that said it wasn't a woman's. It was Thomas Darth. I swear it was Thomas Darth's voice. And half of his face, the other half still angels. I must have screamed at the top of my lungs because... I watched that thing that stood before me, at least the part that was the mild-mannered Darth, shrink away in fear of the violence of that scream. Just as quickly, any lingering quality of Mr. Darth had vanished. But so now had Angel's characteristics also changed. She had grown taller now by at least 50%, now towering over me. I heard a crunching sound as she moved towards me in a stumbling fashion with her shoulders in a lopsided position and arms akimbo at an odd angle. I watched as eight fleshy, spider-like appendages that had sprung from her backside lifted her high off the ground towards the vaulted ceiling of the room. She let out a roar that sounded almost reptilian, and as those legs lowered her down towards me, I witnessed a face that had become like that of a snake, its jaws open wide to reveal a mouth full of incisors as long as my fingers. In that moment, I revealed what had, until then, been kept hidden, strapped to my back. I pulled out my 12-gauge sawed-off and shot straight in front of me at those rows of gyrating and stumbling spider legs and let loose that cannon. I watched as three of those legs appeared to vaporize into a cloud of thick black liquid. As the structure that supported the creature became unstable, the torso swung wildly and came crashing into the ground like a falling tree. As soon as it hit the ground, it was on its feet again, but it was Angel now, bleeding out of her backside. She leaped onto me with the quickness of a wolf spider and sunk her teeth into my shoulder. I let out a terrible scream of pain whereupon the vice-like jaws loosened, and I saw Thomas Darth again. Run, old boy. Don't follow me. Run away. He disappeared through the kitchen door, and as it swung open, I watched him disappear out the window into the night. Thomas, I screamed as I ran into that kitchen and hoisted myself onto the counter. Thomas, stop. I dove through the window head first and landed in a bush. As I disentangled myself and managed to stand, I realized how bad my shoulder was bleeding out. It was numb up to that point, and I felt no pain, wondering if those teeth had injected some kind of anesthetic. I saw Darth retreating across the yard towards the woods, and I started running in that direction without understanding why. I didn't know why I was chasing, or what I would do if I caught up. Would I use the 12-gauge to explode the head of this creature like a melon? Or would I try to reason with Mr. Darth? Or would I fall into Angel's hands again, melting like butter in a hot pan? I'd only made it halfway across the yard when I collapsed. The last thing I saw was Thomas Darth clearing that lazy river in a single bound and disappearing into the fog of the woods and the night. The cops found me in the early morning. The nearest neighbor of Mr. Darth had been walking his dog out in the woods that night. He'd heard my hand cannon going off out of season and gone out to investigate. Mr. Darth was never found by the police. I learned later that he'd been a magnate for alternative energies and his disappearance did make the papers. He'd been part of a global organization called the World Economic Forum. I imagine somewhere out there the rich and powerful are hiding Mr. Darth. Maybe they got him a new identity, and maybe he's someplace else right now. South America, Europe, maybe East Asia. He wasn't wanted for any crime, so it wasn't like anyone in law enforcement was looking for him exactly. But just because he wasn't 
wanted doesn't mean he wasn't guilty for any crimes. Crimes of the heart. Angel had burned me good. I think she was the first woman I ever loved, and maybe that's why I never got married. That's if you could call her a woman. To this day, I still don't know what to call her. Whether Thomas Starr's condition was the result of some kind of satanic ritual or whether it was a mere freak of a most cruel nature, I cannot say. I've seen enough in my career to seriously consider both propositions. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed and by no means a scholar, but due to my line of work, I've had to learn some things about the history of mankind and its different races of peoples. Ancient peoples during the earliest days of man worshipped what might be described as a hermaphroditic god. Maybe Thomas Darth has been around since long before mankind rose from the jungle of the apes. Look, I know how this all looks. That's why I needed to tell the story my way. Like I said, I've already been through the great ego death and I couldn't care a jot what you think of me. Was I with a passionate woman or did I make intercourse with a beast from hell, a veritable demon, a leviathan? Is my soul now damned to hell forever? I'll leave that up to you to decide since I stopped asking questions like that a long time ago. I'm okay not knowing. For this was far from my last brush with the unknowable. All I know for certain is that I... Jonathan Gannon, private investigator, will never stop searching for my angel, who planted that seed of desire in my mind which cannot be uprooted. For the one thing I didn't mention to you yet, when the beast had transformed, in that moment its belly had been swollen with pregnancy. Angel was with child, and I know one day that child of mine will come back for revenge. When it does... I'll be ready.